Welcome back to the second series of Coppers and Brass. Uh, in the next six programmes, we're going to be looking at a wide range of, of issues in Irish traditional music. Um, the first programme this evening, we're going to uh, look at the legacy of Sean O'Reilly, and I'm delighted to have you in the studio with me, Sheila Denver. Sheila, you're very welcome. Thanks very much, Tommy. We'll be coming back to you in a second to explore some of the great uh, contributions that O'Reilly has made and some of the legacies and, and maybe some of the myths. But in the meantime, let's have a look at this short overview of O'Reilly's music. Trying to assess Oreda is very difficult, I think, because I don't think we understand enough of what he did yet. Um, I often say to students, he was somebody who was opening doors. Um, I don't know that Oreda himself was fully aware of all the doors he was opening, um, but certainly he was making connections, and I think those connections go on to do things beyond what Oreda did, and without him, perhaps we wouldn't have the music and the music scene and the sense of community wouldn't have evolved in the same way. I think he came around at a very particular point in the history of Irish music. I mean, in the 50s, you have cultists starting, you have the activity in the radio, um, and Arita is part of this energy as well. I recall one occasion we were playing at the Gaty the Katie Theatre and the Castle Katie Man were playing on the first half and Kjol Tori Kulin were playing in the second half and three of the members of the Castle Katie Band were also playing Kjol Tori Kulin. But Orida had, had, um, had much more of, a, of an impact and the, 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 he, was a, he captivated the, the media mainly due to his, uh, his arrangement of Mission Area which is brilliant. And that's electrified people, and he he attracted people who wouldn't have been otherwise interested in their music. I think he was very important um, because he brought in different instruments, and um, in terms of tunes and things, it was also good because. Sometimes with traditional Irish music, if you go to a session and you're not from the area and you go there and you go in, it can be very intimidating if you don't know any of the tunes. But if you start playing a re of the tunes and stuff like that, that everybody's heard them, everybody can be together and it involves a lot more people and it's more enjoyable that way. And it can make it less scary and daunting going in and not knowing anyone. That's like Sean Arita, he record. He would have got tunes from the harping tradition, so Terlico Carlin. And if you go into a session anywhere, they're bound to know Terlico yeah, Carlin. Yeah, they know something. something. Even yeah. if they don't know the name of it, they know something. Yeah. yeah. So we've a lot to thank Sean Arita for mm. that. Mm -hmm. What's interesting about Arita is he is one man, okay, and he's controversial in some ways. He came up with the notion of um, mixing classical and Irish music together because that wouldn't have been done ever. It would just, it would, they would keep the two separate. Nobody would have put them together because it was as if it was like something the devil would do. Orida is nearly um, the the backwards uh, model for what happens for a lot of musicians. Um, I think an awful lot of people recognise Misha Eyre in 1959 as kind of a seminal moment, where Orida takes tunes from the tradition and from the song tradition and arranges them for orchestra, brings them out to mass appeal, and. Um, I know I've read somewhere where he was disappointed that people thought he composed the air when in fact it was Roisin Dove and that idea that people should know about the tradition. The classical influence I think led to a lot of development with, with other players who, who aren't traditional musicians, strictly speaking. Uh, the likes of myself and Siobhan here who would have been in a background of rock and funk and jazz and the likes of that. It led to kind of people experimenting in different ways, and we got bands like Planksty and Moving Hearts and Bioga and the likes of them. And so I think and Sweeney's Men, yeah. and it just led to a whole lot of development where we have Irish traditional music as this huge worldwide mm. phenomenon. Especially when Riverdance came out, I mean Riverdance really changed a lot of stuff, yeah. and they added all these different styles of music. I think Arita kind of was the first one to really kick that off properly. Well, he. he uh, he gave it a different voice and a different platform and he 
you know, the, the, the media were, were found on him, a person was able to, he was a uh, well capable of interacting with them on all levels. And he was a uh, uh, very attractive man in so many ways. And, you know, he brought that dimension. He was a very confident person. But it, it wasn't uh, universally liked by everyone. I recall some of the old guys in the club, they didn't understand them starting and stopping and, and people doing solos, whereas they would play a tune from start to finish. And similarly down in County Clare where they danced, if you stopped you think there was something wrong and one fellow to play a fiddle solo and come back into the group. So that wasn't a part of their tradition. But uh, some of the people were just completely utilitarian. They played for dancing and that was it. He's also sensing there's something missing. And I think meeting people perhaps like John Kelly uh, and hearing what John Kelly can do with the fiddle, I think Aurelian perhaps finds something that he wants to find in, in John Kelly and in some of the other musicians that he meets in Dublin and also in his travels around um, after that, which were of course again guided by Kelly himself. So from that point of view, he's grappling with two very different ideas. The ensemble sound from so many different traditions and the creativity of the individual or the solo musician. And he's trying to find a place for both. And Tori Coolin, I think, in particular, is an attempt to find that. Um, and it's very different to what he does with Misha Era or the orchestral score. So it's difficult to assess how successful his attempts at arranging the music and, and creating new sound were. But certainly when we listen to what else is going on at the same time, it's quite revolutionary. So from that point of view, I think he is successful. I think He's only one step along the road to where it's going, but I think he is successful. But also recognizing he is successful, very dependent on the contribution of the wonderful musicians he was working with. O'Reilly will be remembered as being a, a having left a, a rich legacy of music and had brought a marked change to our treatment of Irish music that had his personal stamp on it. He had a certain amount of uh, innovation that was welcomed and he, he encouraged uh, debate and analysis of our music which is to be welcomed. But to assess his legacy is difficult because we must assess the legacy of those that he influenced uh, and those influences I think are quite varied. Well, some very uh, differing and interesting views on Aurora there from uh, people young and old, some who knew him and some who uh, are inspired by him. But Sheila, before we get into Aurora, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and your own background, particularly in relation to the music? Certainly. Um, I'm from Inverin in Connemara, mm -hmm. the Connemara Gaeltacht, and I'm a Shannon singer and a harpist. Um, I'm now lecturing in St. Patrick's College in Drumcondra, um, but I suppose I've, I've spent most of my life either um, learning music or playing music or teaching music. And I also play in a, a band called Leathan, and we're still on, we're on the go for around 10 years now. Right, what, is that a traditional band? It's a traditional band mm -hmm. of singers and musicians, ah, six good. ladies. Yeah. So a bit of orchestration going on there? Absolutely, yeah. So okay. we've two fiddles, an accordion and harp and mm -hmm. flute and whistle. Yeah. So maybe that provides the opportunity to take your experiences and, and maybe just mm -hmm. give us an overview of Oreda. Who, who was Sean Oreda? Well, I suppose Sean Oreda was one of the most important figures in Irish music. Um, I suppose the 50s and the 60s were a very interesting time in Irish music and that's when Sean Oreda came to the fore, a composer, a musician himself, um, and an Irish speaker, which was very interesting also. And he's had a huge influence on musicians and also on the academic side of Irish music. Did that uh, Irish language influence in any way his musical development or I attitudes? think it did because the language is so um, connected with the Shano singing. And Sean O'Reilly had a big interest in Shano singing and he believed um, that Shano's, to understand the Irish music, Irish traditional music, you needed to understand the Shano singing and how um, musically and also linguistically. Mm -hmm. So Sean wasn't brought up with Irish, but he decided that it was so important to him that he moved his family to the Gaeltacht in Cúlé, which is <clears throat> where his mother was from, um, 
later on in life and he learned the language and he was also uh, probably one of the most important figures that brought Shano singing to the fore for the wider community, mm -hmm. brought it outside of the Gaeltacht, brought people like Tharach O'Cohan mm -hmm. and Sean O'Shea and Sean Zahora from Kerry had a huge influence on him as well. So the, the, the 50s and early 60s was a very interesting time. Um, O'Reira was at his zenith. Um, what would have happened if he hadn't been around? Where would the music have gone, do you think? Um, it's a very interesting question and like you said it was such an important time in for Irish music and for Ireland in general. So Oreda was in Dublin at a very important time when Gaelin was coming to, to the fore and um, they were promoting Irish music and um, the, the film Misha Ada was being made and Oreda's um, use of Irish music and that was very important and then I suppose meeting musicians around Dublin and bringing them together. So sometimes music needs one person for all those things to come together. Mm -hmm. So it's very difficult to say, would that have happened if Oriada hadn't been part of it? Mm -hmm. I don't think it would have happened in the exact same way because he had such strong opinions about music and particularly about group playing in Irish music. And I think he wanted to bring this um, sort of a higher art form to Irish music because he believed, he believed it was a higher form of music, that it wasn't just folk music. So all of these things happened at this time and I think it would have been very different if Oriada mm -hmm. hadn't been part of it. It'd be good to speculate if we had it would, the time yeah. <laughs> where exactly it would have gone. Yeah. But unfortunately we're running out of time so we're going to take a little break in the chat and we're going to go back over to the cobblestones and join a group of wonderful young musicians, the Mulligan family. Um, myself, Sive, Quiva and Maeve are going to play two hornpipes, Con McCarthy's and the Home Ruler.
Well, that was, I think, a bit of the pure drop from mm. the Mulligan girls there. Absolutely beautiful Lovely. music in, yeah. the, in the cobblestones. So, Sheila, back with Sean O'Reilly, mm. you'd mentioned a couple of things earlier I would like to develop them. One is uh, the impact that he made in group playing. Um, mm. how, do, how, do, how did that happen and what sort of an influence did he have on ensemble or group playing? Well, I, I think the way we imagine group playing now, we think of groups like Alton and yeah. the Bati Band, Scarabray mm -hmm. before that. None of that would have happened in that way, I don't think, other if it wasn't for Sean O'Reilly and Kjol Tori Kulin. Um, his instrumentation was very important. The way he played the tunes, the, the way he would have had different rounds of the tunes being played. It was the first time really that Irish music was brought together as an ensemble, yeah. other than the Cayley Band that he was very mm -hmm. critical of. <laughs> so uh, the antithesis of the Cayley Band yeah. really, that's what Kjoltori Kulin was for him. Yeah. Um, and the instrumentation is interesting in a way because, particularly with the harpsichord, he had this idea of the harp of the sound of the old harp as it was um, mm. back in the 16th, 17th, 18th um, centuries. And he wanted to recreate that sound and have that as a, a crucial part of the group playing. But the harps weren't developed enough at the time. So it would be very interesting if he was alive now, mm -hmm. what he would make of, of how the harp has developed as an, in, a, an instrument. Indeed, mm. and how groups have developed, mm. even beyond yeah. Scarabray or Bothy Band. Absolutely. And the, another the, the part of the group playing is the way that he brought Shano singers into the group mm. playing. That is one of the most important, for me personally, that's the one of the most important things that O'Reilly did. He brought people like Dara Ho mm -hmm. onto the gaiety stage. That would never have happened. Someone like Dara Ho would never have been heard. Um, and Sean O'Shea, and he was very interested in Sean Zahor as well. Mm -hmm. And that idea still, is in a lot of the traditional bands, having an Irish song as part of the group and an ar arranged version of an Irish song. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure that that would have happened if Sean O'Reilly hadn't had such um, strong opinions about Shano singing being an integral part of the music. Has there been a, uh, <clears throat> a downside to that? Um, it, did that influence the direction which Shano singing developed? Did it become or did it express a need to be more commercial as a result of exposure through O'Reilly's ensemble context? I don't think so because he did both because he put Dara Hokohan on stage and to sing unaccompanied Shano singing as as if he was in a pub or at home and he also did versions with Sean O'Shea arranged mm -hmm. versions and um, so I don't think it's, ha it's had a negative impact okay. at all on Shano singing because Shano singing still had the Erechtus and still had all of these competitions and still had the mm -hmm. the Gaeltacht's um, side of things where the tradition was functioning in its natural setting. Mm -hmm. So I think it was an interesting thing to bring it out of that mm -hmm. setting and bring it onto a, a wider stage. Okay. Well, Sheila, uh, unfortunately time's mm -hmm. running out, so uh, I'd like to ask you for a final assessment overview uh, of O'Reilly. Can I, can I just say that in, in the making of this particular episode, mm -hmm. I, I was struck by, by the amount of people who wanted to say, come on and say something positive about Areda. And some of those people off camera were prepared to be more, mm -hmm. more critical. And there's lots of people, well-known musicians, who, who wouldn't come on because they would want to be more mm -hmm. balanced and more, more critical. And I wonder why is that? Why do you think uh, people uh, revere him and at the same mm -hmm. time uh, are reticent about being critical of him? Yeah. I think it's difficult to be critical about somebody who's had such an impact on the music and such a positive impact. Um, I suppose with my other hat on, not my musician hat, mm -hmm. my lecturer hat as an academic, looking at some of the things, particularly our musical heritage, which was published as a book af mm -hmm. after the radio series, he was quite dog dogmatic in his approach to Irish music mm -hmm. and very black and white. Like the accordion um, was a mm -hmm. shocking instrument for him. And for me, the accordion is the essence of yeah. Irish music, music in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. So he did have um, an impact on ac the academic side as well. People might have followed him too much without challenging some of these ideas that were very black and white. Mm -hmm. But I think people are looking back now and it's, it's easier in hindsight mm -hmm. maybe to have a more balanced approach to what he had to say. Mm -hmm. Well, Sheila, thanks very much. Um, we really enjoyed our, our very brief chat and look back at O'Reilly. I think it's important to have done it, as, as we said, celebrating the 50th anniversary of our musical heritage. Thanks very much and continued you, success Sheila. with the group. Thanks very All much. All the best. Thank you. Well, that was Sheila and um, uh, helping us try and understand and appreciate the, the great legacy of Sean O'Reilly. Um, that's the end of this episode. The next episode next week will look at the issue of Irish traditional music, whose music, looking at it, the issue of identity and traditional music, particularly in the context of the Protestant and Catholic communities 
that share this island. Uh, my guest then will be Danny Diamond, and we're looking forward to his informed views on that. In the meantime, take care and many thanks. Slong. <laughs>